So I got a brief word I want to share with you. Uh, I'm stuck. I'm still stuck um, where I'm stuck uh, with this whole issue of the fact that um, prayer changes things. So I'm stuck there. And I just want to share a couple of things with you. So go with me to um, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And keep your finger there as we um, just share briefly on that uh, as they try to work through some of the challenges that they have on the back screen. And then we're going to allow God to be God. Amen. Let me pray and then we're going to go into the word. Lord, we thank you for you. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for who you are. You're a wonderful, phenomenal God. We thank you for worship, Lord, because all we want is just for you to be glorified and for you to be lifted high. So we thank you. We thank you for that moment, that God moment where we can worship you. So we lift uh, your name on high. We celebrate you. We give you praise for who you are, that you may be glorified. It's all about you and not about us. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. What a wonderful God we serve. Come on, say, return to your and say, neighbor. Prayer changes things. Tell your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Prayer changes things. Amen. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, you better get out of my face? Y'all ever heard that? You ever had that told to you? Some of y'all said it just this week, amen, yeah. <laughs> Better get out of my face, yeah. Um, when I was a kid growing up, uh, I would get in trouble. And, and, and getting in trouble sometimes, my father would call me into his room, and in his anger, he would reprimand me. And um, West Indian, so that means in the Caribbean, when they correct you, it's not words. Hallelujah, kind of get what I'm saying? And so, and then at the end of that correction, my dad would say, you better get out of my face before I, and then you can fill in the blank. You kind of get what I'm saying? Just something he would say, man, before I just give you another whooping or another whatever he needs to do. And it was interesting about that phrase is that I noticed that, that when I get in trouble with my mom, or my, it was my stepmom at the time, she would use the exact same phrase my dad would use. She'd call me in the room and handle her business, and in her anger, she said, boy, you better get out of my face before I slap you, the kingdom come, you know? Yeah, come on, some of y'all said that. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you, amen. And then, and then here's the interesting thing. When I grew up and I started having children, um, my poor Gerald, hallelujah, I hope he's watching online. Gerald, forgive me. Um, yeah. I'd, 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 I'd light that little behind up, and then I started to sound just like my mom and dad. You better get out of my face, amen? <laughs> Notice I would say the same thing to him. I would repeat the same action. And then, and then even in my marriage, right, in my relationship, in my relationship, amen, my lovely, fine-looking wife, good-looking as she is and all that stuff, when she get upset with me, Lord, boy, you better get out of my face, you know? I, it seems like I, I grew up hearing that phrase over and over and over. And, and, and here's the interesting thing. She wouldn't only use it in a negative context, I mean, in, in the bad times, but there's sometimes, you know, when I want to get, I want to get next to you. And, you know, and, and I'd go up and be all nice and smiley. And y'all know how we do, brothers, you know. And then, yeah, she, she's not in that mood in that moment. And you better get out of my face. And then, <laughs> And then she just pushed you away, right? I'm like, that hurt my feelings, you know. But, but I'm, noticing, I'm, I'm noticing that as humans, that's a phrase that we tend to use a lot with each other when we want people away from our presence. But what's interesting about that phrase is I have searched Scripture, and I have searched the Bible a lot, and I have not found one instance in Scripture where God says to any human being, you better get out of my face. Come on, y'all. Amen. Amen. I have yet to find one instance in Scripture where God says to any human being, you better get out of my face. As a matter of fact, when you go to Scripture, I have discovered that quite the opposite is true. There is always a constant invitation for us to get into his face, for us to get into his presence, and not for us to leave. Matter of fact, I, I, I kind of cited a few scriptures that I'd like to, to read to you if you can get a chance. So here's what Chronicles says, right? It says, glory, uh, Chronicles 6, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Watch this. Seek the Lord 
and his strength. Seek his presence continually, right? Look at another one. Here's what Chronicles 11 says. And those who had their hearts said, look at the phrase, to seek the Lord God of Israel came after them from all the tribes of Israel to sacrifice to the Lord God their fathers. There's a couple more. I want y'all to see this because it's a pursuit. God talking to Solomon. And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with what kind of a heart? A whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. And look at that. If you do what? Seek him. He will be found by you. But if you forsake him, what will he do? He will cast you off forever. Look at this other one. This is, once again, uh, um, in the book of 2 Chronicles. So, and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord from all the cities of Judah. And notice what they did. They came to the Lord. No instant, no place. And I love this one. This is one of my favorite ones. Seek the Lord. How? Yeah, you get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, it, it's like when we try to get romantic with God, he doesn't say, you better get out of my face. And what I love about it, even in his anger with us, he doesn't say, you better get out of my face. It seems like quite the contrary is true. There is always the invitation to want to get into the presence of God. What's interesting about that, matter of fact, it seems in Scripture that the opposite is true, that when we sin, the plea is that God, please don't tell me to get out of your face because you're mad with me. That seems to be the prayer in Scripture. Matter of fact, if you look at David, when David sinned with Bathsheba, his concern was, like my dad, God would call him into the bedroom, reprimand him, and say to him, you better get out of my face. But, but David noticed that God doesn't operate like that. So here's what he says in his prayer, right? He says, oh, Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me. Answer me. You have heard me. Look what he says. Seek my face. My heart says, your face, Lord, do I seek. And look what he says. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, Oh, you who have seen my help. And look at it. Cast me not off and forsake me not, O oh God of my salvation. So it's like David is pleading, God, whatever you do, don't say that to me. Because that's not the pattern of God. Come on, isn't that good news, y'all? Listen, listen to what he says when he sinned, his prayer of repentance, right? When he messed up with Bathsheba. Create in me, God, a clean heart. Oh, God, renew a right spirit within me. And look at that phrase. God, please, whatever you do, don't tell me you better get out of my face. Oh, my goodness, cast me not from your presence and don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me, he says, what? The joy of my salvation. We serve an awesome God, a God that loves us, a God that cares about us, a God that, that does not have in his heart to remove us away from our face, his face. The problem, though, that I see with the human race, and there I say Christians in general, is that we're so used to using that phrase with each other, and that phrase has become such a cultural norm that whether we realize it or not, subliminally, we treat God the same way. We treat God the same way. And, and we don't do it intentionally, it's just because we think because I say to my spouse or my spouse would say to me or I say to my children or my parents may have said to me, you better get out of my face. We have a tendency that when everything seems to be going okay, we act as if we don't need you. And then we carry that same thing into our relationship with God. When all is well, we act as if we don't need God. And I want to say to you, whenever we develop that mindset, that gets us into trouble every single time. And when you look at the text that's in front of us, that is the very problem that exists in the text today. You will notice with me, and then we're going to talk through this, just a couple of things I want to share with you, that when Solomon finished his rededication of the temple, I've said this every week by way of literary, literary context, and I want to say the same thing again. His prayer to God for the Israelites, like, Lord, when they sin, and they will sin, he says, all they need to do, listen to the words I'm going to use this, this today, is they, all they need to do 
is position themselves back in your face or in your presence, and I know you're going to forgive them, okay? When they blow it because they've been defeated, all they need to do is position themselves back in your face, and then a God, I know you're going to hear them. And you know the story, chapter 7 says that fire came down and filled the temple, and God acknowledged Solomon, I heard you. Then chapter 7, verses 11 onward, picks up because it says, late sometime in the night, God comes to Solomon, and then God says to him, I have heard your prayers, I have heard your plea, and then verse 14 picks up. So look with me at verse 14. I just want to be very brief. Verse 13. So the Lord says to Solomon, verse, verse 12, then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sac sacrifice. And then notice what he says in 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people, look at 14. If my people, who are called by my name, shall do what? Everybody say this. Say humble themselves. Humble themselves. We talked about that extensively last week. Go online, listen to that message. And pray and then here's the phrase, and do what? Seek my face. So Solomon, I'm going to make a deal with you. So here's the deal. Here's what we can do. When they mess up, all they need to do is humble themselves and then make their way back into my face through prayer and then watch what I'm going. Listen, I thank God for that. Because it's as if the more I read this text, it's saying to me, and this is the beauty of the worship experience this morning and the beauty of the song that was being sent, because all I'm, all I'm saying, God, I don't want to leave the bedchamber. I hope you heard that. God, I, I don't want to leave the holy place. I don't want to leave the holy of holies. I want to be there with you every single time. So here's what God is saying. When you're out there and you mess up and you blow it, I want you to get to the place where you can exercise humility and, and, and just come. Let's hook up. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So there's a couple of things I want to share with you. I want you to get a good feeling. That word seek, that word seek that's used in the text is the word Hebrew word bakesh, right? And here's what it says, to look for, to try to learn information about, implying a diligence in the procurement of the information. So if I'm going to seek God, if I'm going to seek what God is saying, I need to search him out. I need to look for him carefully. And the reason I'm doing that is I want to learn more about him. And I love this. And I need to be diligent in my pursuit of that information, right? Here's, here's face. Here's face. Here's what face means, right? It's, it's nafesh. And here, nafesh, here's what that word means. It, it, it's when Adam and Eve used the word they hid themselves from the face or, or the presence of God. The face of God simply means, I want to be in the presence of God. I want to be in the presence of God. And I need to say this real quick because I want y'all to get this. Um, that phrase, seek the face of God, is what's known as a, um, anthropomorphism, meaning that don't make the mistake of thinking that God has a literal face with eyes and nose and mouth and ears, right? Don't make that mistake because you can't restrict God and box God into the inside perimeters of a body. You get what I'm saying? So, so, so because God is so vast, if God's were to use, if he were to use heavenly terms or godly terms and to say to us, seek his face, here's what would happen to me and here's what would happen to you. Where do I begin? Where would I begin? What does that look like? What does that feel like? What is, I mean, where do I find you? So what God has to do is he causes the authors to use human terms so we can have a point of connection, something that we can identify with to draw us into a relationship with God. So, so it's a metaphor, and all it means is get into the presence of God. Get into the presence of God to hear God, to see God, to understand who God is. So here, I want to share just two things, um, simple things with you. Number one, I want you to understand this morning that when we are seeking God's face, it positions us next to his heart. You got to get that. Come on. 
Here's what seeking God's face does. It positions us right next to the heart of God. I've got four grandkids. One is too old to be close to me. One thinks he's becoming a man. Then I got this little girl. Then I got this one that's too young to ask for anything. The girl has figured out she's a girl. How old is that girl? Six years old? Five? Is she that old? She's not. Five or four? She's about four or five. Here's what she does. I don't even know. I just know she figured out she's a girl. When I walk in the room, if her brothers is coming to the door, she will, oh, grandpa! And she jumps in my lap, and she puts her head on my breast. I love you. I love you, grandpa. And she's touching my wallet at the same time. Where is it at? I love you, grandpa. Because <laughs> she understands if I can get in his presence. Yeah, yeah. And I'm from, Grandpa, what you brought from Colorado? And she knows I can't say nothing, even though I didn't bring nothing. So in the moment, I got to lie. We're going to Toys R Us. You know? <laughs> Why? Because she's gotten in my, you, you get it? Yeah, yeah. I hope this is making sense, right? And she has been positioned next to my heart. Now, here's what happens. When her brothers notice I'm having that dialogue with her, guess what happens? All of a sudden, I got three kids. Does this make sense? And I want us to see God through the same lens, that he's saying the same thing to us. That if we can ever get into the presence of God, it positions us next to the heart of God. Now, I know I use that human illustration, but don't make the mistake of thinking that we get into the presence of God to position us to get the stuff of God. Come on, come on. You're positioned in the presence of God to get to the heart of God so the relationship with God can be strengthened. I want you all to hear me say that because you will notice with David, even in his failing, even in his sin, even in his mess up, here's what God would say about David. He's a man after my own heart. Why? Because whenever David blew it, he had sense enough to position himself into the presence of God to seek the forgiveness and the heart of God and him and God would cuddle up and they would love on each other because that's the kind of God he is. And so here's what God is saying, right? People, here's what you guys do. You, because you use the word get out of my face so much, when all is well, you forget that I exist. And because you forget that I exist, you stray and you go looking at other things. And you go doing other things. So here's the word, right? When you find yourself here and stuff gets crazy, number one, humble yourself. We said that last week. And then pray and seek my face and, I, I, and turn, right? In other words, stop what you're doing and get back to the point of contact so I can do what needs to be done in your life. So here's what that looks like. Just, just some brief things I want to share with you all. Here's what that looks like, right? It means that to seek God face means that I need to pursue God. I need to press into God's presence, and I need to do that by knowing God's word. So, so our life, when it comes to, if we're going to be a church of prayer, if we're going to be a place of prayer, that means that God cannot be second place in our lives. I'm going to say amen. He's got to be the first thing, the first person, the first entity. When we wake up in the morning, the first thing we ought to do is give him praise and celebrate him and honor him. And then the issue of this is that the prayer, the prayer ought not be the simple, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. There's a press 
that's required, that we must get desperate, we must get hungry, we must get to the place where we are tired of commonplace. And God, I'm going to labor before you because I need you. The reason a lot of us can't encounter God in our life's challenges is we don't spend time with God, seeking God, pressing into God to really encounter the heart, the hand, and the miraculous from God. We don't know what it is to wait on God. And the reason for that is because we live in such a right now generation. Everything is so instant. Everything is so right now. Everything is so in the moment. So the longest we can pray is five, well, you can't even make it five minutes. The concept of praying for an hour, that's scary. Why? Because we're not used to being in his presence. So here's what it looks like relationally with God. It's like meeting a stranger on the seat, on the street. We encounter God. What's up, God? What's up, Felix? How you doing, man? I'm cool. Are you cool? I'm cool. You got nothing to say? Well, I don't know you like that. Because I don't spend time with you. <laughs> it's like meeting a stranger. There's no dialogue. There's no conversation. Because they're talking and conversing is not commonplace. We talk to our enemies a lot longer than we do than talking to God. Because we don't understand what it means to press into his presence. Okay? Last, thirdly, that also means to know his word. Here's what David said. Thy word have I hidden where? In my heart that I may not do what? Sin against you. People, if we're going to become a church of prayer, a place where prayer changes things, we must have a working knowledge of the Word of God. And here's what I mean by a working knowledge. I'm not just talking head knowledge to say, I know what the Scripture says. I know what that verse says. I mean this, such that when we find ourselves in a, a predicament, God's Word shows us ourselves in the light of the Word, and we adjust first. I know your word, so I don't sin. Not for me to tell others, but so it can keep me in your presence. A lot of us have a knowledge of God's word, yet we're not in his presence because all we know is so we can check others, so we can tell others, so we can be Pharisaic. This is what I know. This is who I am. This is what I studied. But we never see ourselves in the light of God's word. Come on, say, know God's word. Here's some things you already know, and then we're going to get to the second thing, and we're going to wrap this up. So what happens when we turn to God's face, when we turn away from? You know this already. No rain. The locust comes, and the pestilence comes. Here's what that means. When I'm positioned outside the protection of God, here's the reason no rain comes. Lock into this. Don't, don't, don't hear, hear this. It's not so much that God is punishing me, okay? But it's God showing me that I cannot make it on my own. And I recognize that if I know the word, I see the rain stop and I say, oh, I must have drifted too far. And I come back. I hope you got that. It's a reminder when the locusts come. And I can't get a job and I can't get provision. Here's the reason the locust comes. It's not punishment, but it's a reminder that, oh, I need to get back in the presence of God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When the pestilence comes, it's not so much that it's a punishment. Because here's what he says in verse 13. When I withhold the rain, when I send the locusts, when I send the pestilence, don't view it, don't view it as punishment. View it as a jealous God who wants you to come back in his presence. And it's like a dog that's on a leash that has wandered too far. When the dog goes far enough, the leash tugs his neck and the dog says, oh, I'm tied to the chain. Let me get back. Because notice what happens when you come back. Hey, guys, pray for me. Isn't that amazing how that works? I'm struggling. Hey, guys, pray for me. I'm sick. Hey, guys, pray for me. Provision isn't going well. Hey, you, does this make sense? The goal is reminder to get us back because here's what it looks like. Here's what he says, right? Deuteronomy 28 says the same thing. The benefits, constant rain. Benefits, no locusts. 
The benefits, no pestilence when we stay within the presence of God. So let me say this one more time. Seeking God's face then, it positions us next to his heart. Repeat after me. Say self. Seeking God's face positions me next to his heart. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, when you seek God's face, it puts you next to his heart. Now, let me tell you the beauty of the worship experience this morning is this thing here. And this is what touched my heart when the worship team starts to sing that song this morning. Seeking God's face implies the community pursue God in corporate worship. I want, I want you to process that for a little while because I, I, I want to hear this. Hear this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face, pray. Okay. Let me flesh this out with you. Solomon had just prayed a prayer of dedication, and his concern was for the nation of Israel, right? His concern was not so much for one individual member of the community. It was for the entire community. You got to get this. You got to get this. I'm working through this. And so he says, God, when the people find themselves defeated, when the people find themselves without rain, when the people find themselves being attacked by locusts and pestilence, and he used some different words, if they would just look, right? And then God comes back in 7 and 13, and he says to them, when I withhold the rain, so on and so forth, listen to what he says, if my people, does this make sense? If my people, it's a corporate term, very, 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 very important, because if, if, if my people would humble themselves and pray and then seek my face. And, 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 and what's deeper about that phrase, seeks my face, throughout scripture, what's nuanced about it, it kind of speaks more to the importance of corporate worship, the importance of, of people coming together in the presence of God to hear God, to sense God, and to feel from God. Let, let me tell you what happened to me this week. I'm processing this word, and then in the middle of the night, I'm telling you in the middle of the night, I think it might have been Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the Lord woke me up, and I sent a text to my oldest son, and I said to him, uh, his name is Felix, but we call him Gerald. I said, hey, Gerald, um, you might want to get those kids in church every Sunday. This is what I said to him, because here's what my son does. And no malicious intent, he doesn't mean anything by it. He's just a busy business guy that keeps himself going, and he has his own framework. They get up in the morning, and they log on online when they remember to, and they watch service. Okay, And so I remember going there to visit one time, and it was a Sunday, and the kids are not in church, and it was like a norm to them. It was a norm. So I said to him, hey, Gerald, you might want to get those kids in church. And here's what I said following. I said, because if you don't, they're going to grow up thinking not going to church is a cultural norm. I thank God for his response. That's all he said. Heard and understood. That's what he said. And I said, well, I'm so proud of you. Because I was wondering what you was going to say, not another fight. That's all he said, heard and understood. Because he was raised that way. Right? And the importance of corporate worship is that it propagates the word of God and it keeps us in community crying out to God with one sound, with one voice, and it continues to carry on the message of the gospel. If we fool ourselves into thinking going to church is becoming old-fashioned, And that's the problem with the millennial age, isn't it? That's the problem why we can't get them in church. That's the problem with some of the very people in our families because we haven't brought them up in this place to come together to worship God. We're missing the essence of who God is. And so rain isn't coming and locusts is coming and pestilence is coming and we can say all we want to them if they don't understand what it means to come back and seek the face of God in the corporate setting. My gosh, I'm telling you there's something there. If my people, I was sick and I thank God that not only my wife prayed in private but the corporate body. You get it? 
You guys take light the scripture. If you're sick, call the elders. They will lay hands on you, anoint your head with oil, and that prayer mixed with faith will make you whole, right? The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous does what? Avail much. Where two or three are gathered. Come on, you know the scripture. You kind of get what I'm saying? There is something powerful about corporate prayer that I'm praying will take light in this body. Because here's the mistake we make. We come to church and we look up at the platform and we fool ourselves into thinking that all the giftings in the house resides here. And we miss the prophet that's sitting out there. We miss the healing, the, the person of healing that's sitting out there. We miss the person with, with, with the miraculous giftings and the giftings for the body that's sitting out there. And if I isolate myself in my isolation, I risk missing the totality of what God has in store for me in fellowship. Here's what happened in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. And notice what happened. No one had needs. One day I'm praying that we get this together. One day I'm praying that we get this together. The important, if my people, not if my person, if my people, not if my person, though the people consist of a group of persons. You get what I'm saying? You by yourself is not God people. You are God's person. When we come together, we can change the world. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on, come on. When we come together, we can have impact. So let me go here. Imagine if as a people, we can come together to cry out to God on behalf of our city. Hear me out. Imagine if as a people we can come together to seek the face and the presence of God. What we felt this morning ought to be commonplace in here because each person brings the presence. And when the community or the combination of the people with the presence come together, I'm telling you the Shekinah glory of God. You think Chronicles chapter 7 verse 1 was something. I could see God moving miraculous in this place, healing and deliverance. Deliverance and all kinds of miracles happen because the people have committed to seeking his face. I can do it by myself all I want. But imagine when we do it together. Here's the last thing I want to say to you. You know this. Matthew 6. If we can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness... What's going to happen? But, but you see, we see seek first, and we see it in isolation as just me. I want you to see it in a corporate setting. My goodness. Imagine what can happen in this place if we all come together. Imagine what can happen in our city. When I say prayer changes things, imagine if we're all praying for the same thing. For the same person, for the same household, imagine what can happen. Now you understand, Acts chapter 2, and no one had any needs. The world was filled with awe as they saw what God was doing. Watch Acts chapter 2. The community was together seeking his face. The community was together humbling themselves. The community were together praying. And in their prayer as a community, they heard that Sally had need and the need was met in the community. <sighs> Let me, one more and I'll stop. They heard that Pastor Karen's car was broke down and the car got fixed. In, yeah, in the community. Yeah. They, they heard, they heard, they heard that Pastor Derek's basement caught on fire and his basement, that ain't gonna happen, bro, was rebuilt. In the community. You kind of get, you, oh, come on, come on. You, you got to get this. You got to get this, right? They heard that such and such had lost their job and they had no need. They, had, they couldn't provide for themselves. And the community heard and the community stepped up to the place. In isolation, that doesn't happen. Imagine that. Bow your heads with me. Prayer changes things. Come on, Pastor. 
God's a wonderful God. Holy Spirit, I'm praying, God, as you move in this place, that should there be one that don't know you as Lord and Savior, that you would draw them. Should there be one that's saying, man, I want to be a part of that community. I want to be a place where people are praying for me, people are crying out for me. Holy Spirit, draw, draw God. Bring them to a place with you. Thank you, God, that you never say to us, get out of my face. But you're always extending an invitation for us to come. So as your word has gone forth this morning, prayer does change things, God. But there's a, communi a communal aspect of it where... Yes, we pray at home. Yes, we do all that. But there's a place where we have to come together in community and seek your face. And it's amazing what you're going to do. It's amazing how you manifest yourself. It's amazing how you move. So Holy Spirit, if there's one here, God, I'm praying that as a church that we begin the process of repenting and turning and humbling ourselves and saying, man, God, we need you. Oh, we need you. Every hour we need you, God. We need you now more than we've ever needed you before. So God, move in this place, God. Draw people into relationship with you. Teach us to pursue you. Teach us to seek your face. Teach us to press into you. So God, if there's one here that don't know you as Lord and Savior, bring them to say, I want to know God like that. If there's one here that's saying, I'm looking for a church home and I love this community. They're friendly. They're nice. Bring them, God. Let them say, I want to join this church. I want to be a part of this community. If there's one that have strayed away, God, bring them back, Lord. Bring them back. Bring them back. Bring them back to be who you would have us to be, God. So we give ourselves to you. You be glorified. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Come on, let's all stand.